Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Promos, Head of Institutional Content and Investment Magazine, and this is Market Narratives. This show is a series of unorthodox conversations with thought leaders influencing the world of fiduciary investors. For more related insights and analysis, please remember to check out our website, investmentmagazine.com.au, and subscribe for a free email. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. My guest today is John Pierce, Chief Investment Officer of Unisuper. This conversation is a fascinating one as we talk about all aspects of the markets, strategic asset allocation, sentiment, structuring a team, governance, and the role of super in nation building. I truly hope you enjoy it. In terms of where we sit today with the central bank policy um, going where it is, QE's pretty much run its course. We've got huge amounts of fiscal stimulus um, in the US, now also in, in Australia. How do you think about the broader construct of building a portfolio with with so much intervention? Well, I think it's more of the same, Alex. If you look at uh, the dominant theme of uh, the last decade, um, and you can say there you know, are a few themes operating, but to me, the dominant theme was one of financial repression. And uh, for those who got onto that earlier and stayed the course, right, they would have topped the league tables, um, both the equity and the bond market league tables, right? Now, and what you found um, after the GFC, when uh, we were heading into this financial rep- repression, there were there were disbelievers, right? So um, bond yields uh, fell and they said, well, you know, they'll eventually get back to normal and normal was something, you know, north of 5%, et cetera. Um, but those said, who adopted the, the philosophy that, no, no, this is going to be lower for longer. And um, it, it took a few years for that to really get inculcated in um, a lot of uh, the, the models. Uh, I think we're now seeing this extended, right? We were potentially um, on the road to recovery uh, prior to, to this crisis. Um, we were seeing um, some, you know, uptick in, in bond yields and normalisation of yield curves, et cetera. Um, you know, we had uh, less than, you know, bonds in the world that were uh, returning negative rates. Um, now, of course, uh, that's all been reversed. And, you know, it might not be another decade, but you can imagine it's going to be, a, you know, another good uh, four or five years of, of financial repression. And you've just got to accept that. Now, when people, when, when investors say, look, share markets are getting divorced from fundamentals, I, I can't quite reconcile that statement right, with what we're seeing in the bond market. And if you go back to your sort of uh, applied finance 101, um, you know, not only are, are bond yields uh, a fundamental, um, they're the most important fundamental, right? And so we're going to see bond yields hovering between 0 and 1% and in some cases negative um, for four or five years. You've got massive equity risk premiums. So I don't buy the argument um, that that the markets overall are expensive. I, I accept that there are pockets of the market that look, you know, bubble, um, look, look, look uh, they're in bubble territory. And, you know, you can you can talk about your afterpays and your Teslas, et cetera. Um, but applying that to the whole market, I, I just not, I'm just not buying it. So uh, sum, summing that up, still bullish uh, risk assets. But how, do you, how do you then compare? All right, so let's say you've got one one percent as a bond yield and you say well okay that's the best i can get from effectively the the lowest risk but then when you look to the equity markets is that a fair comparison because the bond yields are so low and maybe they're considered to be artificially low because of the stimulus is is that causing this maybe disconnect as to why uh, are they are they artificially low right uh you know and that that's the question you know if you go and look at um the history uh the the recent history of, of quantitative quantitative easing, right? um, when the Fed actually uh, moved into QT, right, bond yields still stayed low, right? So the whole argument that um, these bond yields are just kept being kept artificially low by the Fed, um, it didn't apply for a period. So there was something else at work. And what, what, what's, what else is at work? Well, you've got these enormous deflationary forces, right? Now, what, what are the deflationary forces? Well, the the, you know, you talk about demographics, et cetera, there's a, there's a question mark a, around that. But, but the, the main deflationary force is technology. So you, you're constantly seeing supply curves shift to the right. So take your central banks out of it. You've still got these really powerful deflationary forces 
moving your, your supply curves to the right. And even without the influence of central banks, you're going to see really low bond yields. It's interesting, though, because is, it, is there a situation where these low bond yields begets low bond yields? You know, it just sort of perpetuates this this deflationary environment almost. I I believe there's a uh, that there's um, a lot of evidence that that's the case, right? And you know we're seeing uh, we're going to um, see a high prevalence of so-called zombie companies. Now, what do zombie companies do? Um, they keep supply up, keep supply up. You keep prices down. So the very thing that central banks are trying to achieve, okay, is being negated. Um, if uh, you know the, the central banks want to stir up demand, um, hence you know free money, but if what you're doing is shifting supply curves to the right, absolutely, you're, you're putting downward uh, pressure on on prices. But I can't see that changing in the next few years. But somebody's comp- somebody's uh, capital is going to be incinerated in the process, right? These zombie companies, unless they can somehow turn a profit, uh, someone's going to be left carrying the bag. Yeah, but you could argue that um, also that's why you're seeing such a dispersion in valuations at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. And once again, when people talk about how expensive markets are, um, you take um, you, you look at the US market and you, you take the fangs out of that US market and you find that the the, the US market's been quite unspectacular, right? If if you if you look at it, X the fangs, um, if you look at uh, emerging markets, well, you know they're still struggling um, because they haven't got the, the same boost of, uh, of tech. You know, you look at a lot of these uh, European markets. So you could argue that, um, you know, some of these, uh, the, the zombie companies, while they've been, you know, kept on life support, they're not priced, um, they're not priced rich. So, but does that mean if you've got this dispersion where you've got a particular group and, and they're all seem to be within a similar service style sector, technology sector, yeah, you know, is if that's if that's the likely uh, train and the perpetuation of these type of businesses to do well, does that mean asset owners need to sort of move more and more capital there, if that's what the yeah. market's moving towards? Uh, yeah, but you know, ha- how does it end? Right, trees don't grow to the sky. Um, uh, the, if you look look at the history um, of of the U.S. market, which is the the longest history we have um, in terms of a diversified market, the um, the dominance of uh, of a sector can last for for decades. All right, uh, we you know we had the energy sector, we went through when the you know auto sector, etc. Uh, and now we're in the, the sort of the tech revolution um, uh, period. Um, it can still go on for time uh, for some time. We can go on for another decade and and still be uh, approximating where these other sort of um, uh, eras have uh, the length of uh, other eras. Um, how, how does it um, how does it end though? Um, well, with some of the you know the monopolies where they've really built a moat, it's hard to see it ending other than some sort of regulatory intervention, right? H- how do you how do you compete with Google? How do you you know you can compete with Amazon maybe, but really it's 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 really difficult. Uh, Facebook, um, to me, it, it potentially ends with regulatory intervention, but it's not. Obvious to me that that in itself um, is going to be a value destroyer in the short term. There's a, there's a, there's a, a sort of I don't know if the story is true, but it's a good story, so I'll tell you anyway. Um, when um, uh, the uh, the founder uh, of Standard Oil, he was uh, playing golf with his um, with his uh, uh, parishioner, and he said, um, "Do you only own any Standard Oil shares?" And uh, you know the parishioner said, "No, no, I don't." Why? He said, well, well, you should because we're about to be broken up, you know, which is which is counterintuitive. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, the parts were worth more than the sum. And that could be the case with some of these uh, with these big these tech giants. Yeah, look, that's, that's interesting. And look, I've heard a lot around sort of the regulatory change. It's, it's been bubbling away for quite a long time, even before the 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 regulatory issues around sort of Facebook and, and Twitter and so forth and, and uh, the impact that they have on on the social construct, but a lot of the conversation is around the historical regulatory change or the regulatory um, environment doesn't work for situations like Google. Yeah, they're more based on a railroad where you've got a monopoly yeah, or a telecommunications, absolutely. and so you've got a really tricky system where the law almost needs to sort of change or the definition of competition needs to change because anyone can start a Facebook doesn't yeah. doesn't doesn't uh, mean that they can compete. 
Um, That's right. It's a real problem because um, the the law uh, has been put in place to safeguard the consumer, right, um, and the gouge of consumer. But if you look at someone like an Amazon, well, well, the consumer is a hell of a lot better off because of Amazon. Now, on, on its way, Amazon could just destroy a whole swathe of small businesses, et cetera, but the, the consumer is better off. Right? So, so um, when you're talking about antitrust type of law, um, it's, it's got to be geared in a different way to, to stop these, uh, these big companies. It, it almost has to be, look, um, you just can't be that dominant. But, but yeah, where, and it becomes a market dominance type of test rather than you know whether the the consumer is is uh, is worse off. It's fascinating because if you think back to sort of ninety nine two thousand when Microsoft got hit over the head with their antitrust lawsuit, they didn't have the dominance of Facebook or Amazon or even Apple. I would have thought uh, on the enterprise stuff they were pretty dominant, right? Um, what a great company though. Oh, it's totally yeah. transformed to a cloud Transform. business now. Transform. What a what a what a great company. But but you know, if I come back to the, your comments around Amazon, it's it is very interesting because if they start to hollow out so many uh, smaller businesses, and you know those businesses can't compete, then you start to hollow out the whole economy. You start to then lose jobs, and then the whole financial system um, starts to st- break down, right? Because you end up with a monopoly that's just sucking wealth all up, yeah. up the chain. Absolutely, and and you know when Amazon. Uh, and in Australia, it was welcomed with open arms, right, by by the regulators. Because this is going to be a great deal for the punter. But what about all the small business that gets you know caught in the vortex? And then it then it becomes an issue of the government because yeah, then the government's got to fill the tax man, back right? End. That's missing yeah. out. It's this is what's really strange. And if you go back to sort of the you know what's seeing what you're seeing in the US with the top six seven stocks that are really driving the performance, and then if you look below that, they're starting to get hollowed out. And and That's so. Right. You've got the government trying to to back end the financial economy, and so you know there is a bit of an issue, especially as as asset owners now. How do you sort of make sure that you invest for you know the benefit of your members, but at the same time, if you think about members um, on the other side from a more social perspective, it's actually a very tricky task. It is, um, you know, but that doesn't mean that they're the ones making super normal profits. It doesn't mean that the, the other companies aren't making money, right? It's just they're not making the super normal profits. Mm-hmm. I guess, you know, if you think about this broader backdrop, you've mentioned the low interest rates, you've mentioned the US um, being dominated by a couple of stocks, EM struggling as a, as a sector. How do you then build a portfolio in this environment? Um, well, once again, I, we, we look at it uh, from a, a, a high level to start with. And uh, I mentioned uh, the dominant theme of the last decade uh, has been financial repression. Um, The other themes um, that work really well for us is technology, Uh, a theme that that didn't work well for us. Um, We were also bullish on on Asia and we're overweight Asia. Um, It didn't work well for us, but it didn't hurt us because we're also underweight other emerging markets. So... So we're looking at uh, going forward, what, what are going to be the dominant themes? Well, there's going to be uh, a bit of the same. So um, certainly for the next few years, financial repression, um, technology is going to uh, continue to, um, you know, the, the, the revolution continues uh, apace. Um, we're also um, looking at decarbonisation. That, that's going to be a, a very strong investment theme. But unlike others, um, how you play that decarbonisation theme, I think it's where you're going to get the, um, the huge range of views. You know, the, uh, the, simple, the simple sort of um, retort to that as well, renewable energy, and I think, I think that's potentially, a, you know, uh, going to be a, a really slippery slope in terms of a return on investment there. If I look at that whole uh, energy complex, I'm, I'm just not keen on the, the whole sector because you're seeing supply curves constantly shift to the right. Um, I don't think it's going to be a, a great sector to play in directly, uh, but it's going to be plenty of opportunities um, to, to, to look at companies that are going to benefit from um, ever decreasing energy prices. Um, and so it's a classic case in, in the gold rush, um, you, 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 you sell the picks and shovels or buy the companies that sell the picks and shovels. And I think that's, that's, sort of a, that's going to be a dominant theme over the next decade or two. And when you're talking about renewables, is that sort of the traditional solar wind or is there other sorts of biogas? 
um, sorts well, of energy. Well, you know, it covers the whole thing, right? So there's a lot more talk about hydrogen, for example. Yeah, solar and and uh, is obviously going to be the the, the main one. But um, you know, there's a lot of money being uh, being invested on the whole spectrum of of renewables, mm-hmm. and that's the you know that's that's always a danger when um, you know when you've got such a a pervasive theme, you know, um, the, let's call it um, the environmental or the, the green theme, which we, we all agree with. But when something is so pervasive, um, you'll have so much capital uh, chasing that theme. And when there's so much capital chasing the same theme, um, you know, there's going to be grounds for it. Well, it, it sort of sets it up for disappointment, right? Well, we saw that actually in the, in the internet era. Everyone was laying down cables Absolutely. because they saw the internet was coming. Uh, and everyone wanted to get their their cables down first, and then a whole range of these organisations went bust. Uh, and then it did provide a lot of opportunity, and the internet exploded. Maybe that's the same sort of thing to be wary of in the renewable space, not to be too early uh, and and be stuck in overcapitalised parts of the market. Exactly. Sit back and 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 watch the winners. You know who who are selling the who's selling the components. You know who, who's benefiting from uh, the the cheaper energy, etc. I think that's going to be the smarter way to play it. And the energy space will never die. Um, And I guess if you're betting against energy, I think there's a little bit of a a misnomer around energy that's always put forward that some of these companies are are doing poorly in in recent times. But some of that also correlates to the economy slowing down. So energy will always be hit once the uh, energy, uh, sorry, when when the economy slows down, energy seems to follow. So at some point- Yeah, it does. That's that's cyclical, right? Um, So- I'm uh, I'm more concerned about the sort of the structural uh, shift uh, in supply. So everyone tends to focus on demand side of things, and uh, but demand it will be more cyclical, and yet economy slow down, demand fall. But when you've got so much capital being thrown at supply, to me you're seeing just a, an ever increasing supply. Now, you know we're we're seeing some sort of tempering of that. Um, we, we're seeing some of these uh, big. You know, LNG projects, for example, um, that won't get to to FID. Um, so that that will probably temper it. But there is still a lot of money being invested in in energy. Are there any other areas you've obviously mentioned the the tech sector as being? Is there any other themes that are still really prominent that are top of your mind, or maybe not for now, but looking at closely? Materials. Um, are, if you're looking at where valuations are and where you could still uh, potentially, um, you know, you, you can find some value. Um, materials, while they've had a good run, is, there's potentially uh, more to go there. Um, if you look at, if you if you want to bet on a, on a cyclical upturn, we, we know that one day we're going to get on top of this virus, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's one thing we know for a fact. We just don't know when. And, and then what's, what's going to be, the best way to play it. Well, uh, you know, you can, you can look at the traditional sort of cyclical sectors, um, be energy, obviously, but then you've got financials. And if you look at, um, say, US banks, for example, geez, they're in a, they're in great shape from a from a capital perspective, liquidity perspective. Um, we we just the big unknown is uh, the extent of the the bad debt cycle. Uh, but if they get through. Um, this cycle and the provisioning that they have already made is sufficient to, to cover those bad debts, you know, they'll potentially look like a great bet. Now, nobody wants to, only because they're talking about yield curve, they can still make, you know, very healthy net interest margins, even, even with interest rates quite low. Um, the other one, um, and this is going to be a, a complete, um, I guess, contrarian trade at the moment, the ultimate contrarian at, uh, trade at the moment, is uh, is retail, you know, shopping centres, uh, and you can buy some high quality uh, shopping, you know, shopping centres um, or, or uh, REITs at forty percent discount to NTA. Right now, is NTA right? Probably not. But is it forty percent wrong? Probably not. So it's it seems like a brave bet now, but. Um, you know, that would be the uh, that's where some real value is in the market at the moment. Are you still having a bit of a preference towards the the public, you know, the listed space? 
um, across retail, uh, sorry, across real estate, for example, infrastructure. I know you've liked to play in the listed space. Is that still the case? Yeah, yeah, we, we do. Um, and, and if you look, um, case in point being over COVID, you look at the markdowns in, in the listed space, right? Uh, now, now we, we, we own, I'll give you a direct comparison because we own, uh, we own unlisted and listed in property and infrastructure, right? Uh, as a sort of broadly, the airports, the, the unlisted airports um, were marked down around 15%. Sydney Airport, down around 40%. So who's right and who's wrong? You'd imagine the truth lies somewhere in between, but, you know, a rational investor, you've got to say that Sydney Airport has got to be a better buy than those unlisted airports at, at these sort of marks. There's an interesting conversation about risk there as well, as well, as to you know what's actually been sitting on people's books. Yeah, well, it's a it's a it's a also an issue around member equity, right? Yep. Because if you've got members, uh, you know, actively switching, and you've got a lot of unlisted assets in your portfolio, well, you know, I, you, you'd want to hope those marks are right. It's it's a real interesting one because a lot of these assets were also seen as very defensive for for a number of funds. Yeah, yeah, and look, this uh, whole you know we we like the term fortress assets. Right? We 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 like accumulating uh, fortress assets at, uh, at at reasonable prices. And you know we would have argued pre-COVID, we would have argued that Sydney Airport is a classic fortress asset. Well, you know, COVID's probably proved us wrong, right? Yeah, well, it's it's one of those things, right? And that's why you also have a diversified portfolio to try and address these these changes. Correct. And it's uh, yeah. How do you then reposition to try and take advantage of of the whole new market that we that we'll get to right after COVID passes on? Yeah, who would have thought that uh, that these uh, tech companies would prove to be more resilient than uh, than uh, one of the best airports in the world? It's interesting because even for people like Facebook, they, they've relied a lot on small businesses to, to advertise. Yeah. Uh, and yet still, the revenue still seems to be there, um, which is surprising. I would have thought they would have felt a lot more pressure. Yeah. And, you know, you can also maybe a more cynical look at it too. You know, these um, these big companies uh, putting them on a on a hold. First of all, they put them on a hold. They haven't, um, they haven't banned them for life, right? Um, and the other thing is, you know, were they going to cut down their sort of discretionary spending anyway during this time? Yeah, oh, that's 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 fair. I, I know Netflix has definitely gained from from that over their last quarter. They uh, yeah. managed to save a lot of money, but obviously by not not making any movies, which has helped them from a cash flow point of view. But yeah, how yeah. long does that last? Um, you know, the Microsoft uh, founder said he's seen two years of digital transformation in two months um, because you know companies looking at uh, you know the obviously working remotely, um, seen Amazon benefit from it. So, yeah, these, <laughs> these tech companies that, um, you know, it's, it's, um, they seem to come hell or high water, they're, they're still making money. Uh, it's, look, it's, uh, it's great. You know, look, Amazon's had an interesting run. It never was always easy. They, they, they really felt the, the pain through the early 2000s. But, you know, if you think more broadly in terms of just the general economy, you know, the economy has been supported significantly by by government support, and particularly in Australia, um, from from job keeper and job seeker. You've also then had early access that that's allowed for more money to come into the into the markets. How do you then try to distill what is just sort of maybe froth versus money coming back in versus true long term trends of, and how to invest? You know, once the this cycle sort of plays out. Yeah. Well, look, obviously. Um You've got to distinguish between the the companies that are, are most exposed to the domestic economy and, and those that aren't, right? So, um, job keeper, job seeker is not going to impact BHP's prospects that much, but it's going to impact Commonwealth banks, correct? Mm-hmm. So, so that's how that's how you've you've got to distinguish. You know, the, the banks are basically a leverage play on on the domestic economy, whereas you know, the um, you know the resources companies aren't at the at the other extreme. So. Um, that's that's really what we're looking at. We're also looking at how the whole Australia-China situation plays out, and indeed whether you know what we're seeing in um, in beef and barley, et cetera, gets extended. Um, that to us is is potentially even a, a bigger medium-term concern than than how long JobKeeper and JobSeeker 
going for? Because the reality is um, the Australian government, you know, while we don't like the look of the, the current debt profile, it's in pretty good shape relative to the rest of the world. So you can, you can foresee some sort of assistance for as long as it takes. But in terms of relative, um, you know, in terms of where you relatively place your bets, um, you, the banks would be, a, you know, it's more of a leap of faith than, say, the resource companies. The, the banks are, are an interesting one just given the amount of debt that's already in the system um, and the amount of uh, housing debt that's that's currently there. And then you've got this broader issue around sort of wages and immigration that's been slowed down, obviously, due to COVID. Yeah. How does that play on to the banks given that the Australian banks are so heavily geared towards housing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, um, you, you you can read some if, – if you disaggregate that data and, and you know, the classic um, sort of stat that um, the, the bears will point out is your household debt to GDP, right? That So, I look, that you know, Australia's got, you know, one of the highest, uh, rate, you know, household debt to GDP ratios in the world. Um, this is just a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> but aggregates uh, are always – a, a bit misleading, right? Um, so, it also, if you look at uh, Australian household debt to to assets, we we turn out that it was actually one of the the lowest um, in the world. We're, we're, you know, per capita, we're one of the richest countries. If you look at the dispersion of that debt, and the Reserve Bank has done some good work on this. Um, as it turns out, um, the debt is by and large owned by people who can afford to to have the debt. Right? So, it's not as scary as the aggregate looks. It seems from from your thinking that that these themes, these big macro plays, are are really important to building the portfolio. I know a number of funds start to look at risk factors, and they've got tilts to different risk premiums and so forth. Is it fair to say that you're much more sort of in a fundamental? Uh, I've got to be careful with fundamental because that could mean very much bottom up. Yeah. But but you know, very much the theme and underlying holding sort of approach when you build your portfolio versus sort of someone that may think about it from a quantified approach. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, that that would be uh, that be a very uh, a fair description. You know, I, I think there's um, uh, diminishing marginal returns from uh, from applying uh, science to investing. You know, um, you know the uh, in, investing is um, is part science, but but more art. And and as I said, you know, we we all we've all got um, a, a lot of quantitative talent uh, in in our businesses. Um, to the point where it becomes a, a minimum requirement, um, and you know, that uh, Warren Buffett's uh, fam- famous, uh, you know, he's got a lot of uh, fantastic quotes. But you know, if if uh, investing could be you know, distilled to mathematics, well, the the, the Forbes 100 will be put, full of actuaries, right, or, or something to that effect. So, um, you know, we we look um, first and foremost at 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 the thematic. You know, does it does it make sense um, that from a from a high level investment proposition, you do the numbers to to test that, um, but the numbers don't drive your decision. It's the logic first. How much does sort of broader sentiment and relative value sort of play into that those those decisions that you make? Well, broad, broader sentiment, um, uh, you know, that's potentially gives you uh, like a it might impact your timing, but it wouldn't impact your big picture, right? You're not, you know, because ultimately then you become a bit of a momentum trader. And, you know, a fund of our size and inflow, um, we describe ourselves as, a, as, as an acquirer of quality assets at a reasonable price. You know, we're not looking at at getting in and out of, of trades. Even our, our tilts, if we, we can take tilts, but the tilts are not things that we'd have on for a couple of weeks. You know, they can extend for, for a few months. So, we're tending not to look at sentiment. As a matter of fact, when sentiment is getting too strong, we'll probably wait for pullbacks. Would you potentially, you know, if sentiment gets too strong, put put options or, or some sort of other derivatives to try and hedge that that risk that you may see? Well, it, it's it's interesting, Alex. With um, we, with put options, um, it's not as firstly we we've been a, a very heavy user of of uh, of put options for our defined benefit fund. You know, we had a a very large position. Um, it's uh, it's still a large position, but smaller because um, because they've been expiring along the way. Um, and that's for our defined benefit. If you think about a normal 
defined contribution open fund, it's not a simple case to, to buy insurance. And let, let me give you an example, because you know, when you've got constant, uh, you've got members you know, entering that fund every day. Now, if a member's been in there for a long time and that member's up 30%, um, you know, a member might be comfortable paying 1% or 2% for protection. But a member that's just joined you on the day and has not benefited from a big rally in markets, are they going to be happy that you're spending, you know, one or two percent on protection? At the end of the day, they've they've wanted this exposure. They've they've buying this exposure, and you're saying you're telling them, no, you're down two percent because we're buying protection. So it's not a clear cut application when it comes to open ended funds. You know, to me, they put option strategies are, are far more relevant for uh, for for closed funds. You know. Um, you know, defined benefits, sovereign wealth funds, endowment funds, hedge funds, etc. That's when it makes uh, more sense to me. It's interesting you talk there about sort of your members, but you know, UniSuper is not totally public offer. Is that also part of the reason why you, you choose not to to run? No, but look, we we're, we're in constant inflow, right? So um, that wouldn't impact the decision one way or the other about put option protection. Uh, it's more the fact that you've got uh, members constantly joining. You know, we've got. Um, you, University, well, look, obviously, the university sector is um, doing it uh, tough at the moment, but uh, pre-COVID, it was in a strong growth, growth phase. So uh, we, uh, we had members and, and uh, joining, and uh, those members are also able to uh, get family members to join. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to sort of you're talking about sort of the sentiment and, and um, uh, sort of the, the portfolio and, and being tactical uh, to some degree, maybe over a couple of months. I'm curious on the sort of people that you you need, you know, to run this sort of a fund. You talk about having Quant as your as your starting point, but what are the sort of the types of people that that you need to actually build a fund like UniSuper? Well, we've got uh, a whole um, range of uh, <laughs> of uh, shapes and sizes and styles of uh, of people, and I might just um, just allude to the uh, the breadth of of what we do at, at UniSuper. Um, so if you look at, um, at a high level, we're, we're managing about 70% of the money in-house and we, and we outsource about 30%. Um, and uh, we'll always have that, that hybrid model. Um, and those strategies, those in-house strategies, uh, they cover um, global Australia. They cover um, all the asset classes. Uh, we've got fundamental strategies. We've got quant strategies. Uh, we manage uh, defined benefit, uh, defined contribution. So you imagine, you know, with that range um, uh, of, uh, of activity, um, you can't say that we are trying to attract a, a certain style of individual. Um, it, it, it requires um, uh, quite a diversity in, in the skill set. And, and is that diversity in skill set, you know, how do you then bring those people together? Because, for example, you need to have a diversity in, of views around how markets work, around how they they think about sort of macro factors playing in. You know, you've got bond guys that think very different to equity guys yeah. that think very different to infrastructure guys. How, how do you sort of blend that to, to make well, it Well, we've got work? a really unique model. Um, uh, it's a, a, a very flat structure to, to start with. Um, and uh, it's it's also um, yeah, multi-purpose, for want of a, a, a better term, or, cr- or cross-divisional. So um, we have there's a lot of shared resource. We we don't duplicate. So someone in a you know our, our property uh, analyst, all right, would be the property analyst for the property team, and that person, the property analyst, would be for the global equities team and also the Australian equities team. All right, we're, we're not going to have you know, uh, dedicated property people in, in those different teams. Um, when we have, uh, then we have sector specialists and that sector specialist will be backed up by, uh, by one or two other specialists and they might not even be in the same team. So our, our sector specialist for, for consumer uh, is currently reporting in the global team, but her backups, uh, there's, there's one in the Aussie equities team and there's one actually in our, our sort of our middle office, our, our, our portfolio analytics team. So that's that's a sort of um, it, it's a, it's a it's a complex model that um, you know we because we've been brought up with it and we've we sort of made it up as we've gone along and it works for us. Uh, 
that, that, it, that it works for us. Um, you know, the other alternative would be have a, a far more segregated model where, you know, you've got end-to-end global team, Aussie team, property team, et cetera. Um, we've, we've deliberately decided not to do that um, because we just wanted to make sure that we get the, the best of all worlds and we're all working towards a common goal. Mm-hmm. Oh, the cross-pollination is, is always interesting, right, to get the, those different views. Um, yep. Curious, you know, around your your thirty percent that you say is outsourced. You know, is there a reason because of cost that it doesn't make sense, and therefore you outsource it, or do they have different technical skills? What what makes up that outsourced piece? Yeah, absolutely. We it's always a case of um, you know we've got to be honest with ourselves, and there are there are certain strategies that we can't um, we 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 couldn't um, justifiably bring house because we could get it uh, cheaper and better. And that's what outsourcing is all about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, outside. And typically you'll find um, something like, uh, you know, US high yield bonds. We're very active in US high yield bonds. Um, we've been in and out of that market five times. Um, uh, there's no way in the world, you know, we, we could hire a team, uh, build a team to, to manage US high yield bonds. Uh, we've got pure play technology um, mandates. We've got pure play Asian mandates. We've got small cap mandates. These sort of uh, strategies that require large teams of, you know, bottom up fundamental analysts, um, they're sort of the strategies that we're typically going to be outsourcing. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, you know, a, a number of the, the other funds, the super funds are starting to look at insourcing more parts of their business. What, what are probably the, the hardest challenges that you've faced in terms of in-housing? Um, well, the first <laughs> the first challenge is obviously to to make sure you you get your board on site. Mm-hmm. Right? And I was extremely fortunate in that I had a uh, an investment committee, um, and you know I'm still extremely fortunate that I've got an investment committee, um, uh, and that it's staffed by by people who have uh, worked in the industry at the, the most senior levels. You know, we're talking about you know. A, ex-boss of Colonial First Aid, an ex-boss of BT, an ex-boss of Invesco. Um, you know, these guys uh, know what they're doing and know, know what I'm doing. So I never had any problems getting the support um, to, and I know some of my peers, one of their biggest challenges is, is getting, yes, board sponsorship. Um, so that was a real positive thing. Um, with uh, then, then the, 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 the challenge um, is, is um, I guess it's a, it's a people thing. Um, at uh, you know, if if you're in, you're running a uh, a fund out of Melbourne, and you want to keep the team in Melbourne, and and I you know at this point we've been fortunate enough to to be able to do that, is making sure that you can get uh, the right uh, the right people that are happy to come and uh, and work in in Burke Street. That that would be the the biggest challenge. But so far we've met that challenge because we've got a. We've got a really good brand in the market, and um, we've always managed to have people knocking on our door to to join. Long may that continue. I don't know if it will, but um, I'd imagine the competition will heat up. But that would be the single biggest challenge. We're a, we're, a, we're a business that is highly leveraged to the quality of people that we have. The other the other challenge that I, I guess what I was alluding to is around sort of performance and how do you manage that with the external managers? Very easy to to cut people um, yep. and or cut managers. You know, how do you sort of deal with that internal struggle? In some cases, if some part of the business is underperforming, yeah, yeah, and look, that's a that's a fair point. We we have to hold ourselves to the same level of scrutiny, right? That we would hold uh, external managers. So, so once a year, um, uh, we have a, a a very formal process with the investment committee, whereby we go through the in house strategies, and we've got to justify to the investment committee why these strategies remain uh, a hold or a buy. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's the same sort of um, process that you'd go through with uh, with external managers, and on uh, I think three or four occasions we actually sacked ourselves. Right? So we actually went to the investor when he said we, you know, we can't justify um, continuing this strategy. Um, so let's agree that we'll we'll discontinue it. And that doesn't um, necessarily mean that there's job losses, by the way, because as as I said, with our with our model, uh, um, we don't have you know an individual only responsible for one portfolio. 
yeah, they're across many different parts of the portfolio. Exactly, exactly. So there's plenty for, for people to do. You, you mentioned about being in Melbourne, and look, Melbourne's got its own COVID struggles at the moment, but you know, do you feel that there are other struggles in terms of being you know, more and more of a global investor and running out of Melbourne? Do you feel the pressure to maybe have other staff uh, globally? It, it hasn't been a constraint to date, right? Uh, but look, we we would, I'd be very reluctant to set up a, a team offshore. Um, would, it, would Sydney be possible? Yeah, but offshore, time differences, et cetera. You know, I, I used to work in, uh, in, you know, a global organisation. I understand the difficulties. Um, and, you know, you've got to, um, you, you just got to be aware of your, your limitations. And, and I think that's, that's going to be a limitation. And while we've got the bargaining power, you know, we can strike some pretty sharp deals with external managers. There's really good, you know, um, no shortage of good quality external managers uh, offshore. So we'll, we'll likely to con- continue that path. Let's uh, talk to, to the governance challenge, right? And, and super funds are under increased pressure to, to sort of up their governance particularly, you know, in the environmental social space. You know, how, how does that look for you um, as a fund and as a CIO? And, and what, what's actually, how, how do you spend your time, I guess, best to, to make sure that you address the governance challenges that you have with your investments and then also address your member interests as well? Yeah, look, I think what's the, the big difference between now and, uh, and, and, you know, a decade or two decades ago is just, the, uh, the focus that we have on, on ESG um, from an external scrutiny point of view. And I'll, and I'll give you a, uh, you know, ESG has always been part of a sensible person's, uh, a sensible investor's um, uh, toolkit, right? And, and I'll give you a, a real example. Um, so when uh, I was the, uh, I was running the uh, investment um, at uh, Colonial First State in the, in the 90s, I remember we had a we had a really good resources team, and um, you'd walk around, and you'd have a look at the team, and they'd always have these rocks on their on their window ledges and stuff like that. And and I remember asking him, so look, what's what's the main thing that you're looking for when when you go to a mine? You know, they they love to go to the mine and get their hard hats on, etc. And uh, I remember the boss uh, Dave turning around and said, the main thing I'm looking for, right, is evidence of safety. Right? And this is the 90s. This is before the acronym ESG was ever invented. And, and I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, yeah, because if I can see uh, a really safe mine, I know that that management's probably doing a lot of other things right. Because there's a lot of stuff with mining that you can't actually see, right? But evidence of safe, a safe mine has given me evidence that this, this is a management team I can trust. And I think that was a really, really insightful. So you know, and then, you know, but now ESG has become, you know, it's like an industry in itself. Uh, but to any sensible investor, ESG has always been part of their investment process. And, you know, this, this notion of being able to quantify the impact of, of ESG, well, you know, that's just a nonsense. Because anyone that knows anything about a successful business knows that you know, there are, you know, a successful business um, is doing a lot of things right. And to somehow, you know, isolate the ESG factors and put a number on it, as I said, I, I think it's a nonsense. You can't, you can't control for, for all of the other factors. So, so is it um, inculcated into our process? Absolutely. Always has been. Um, more of the case that we've uh, excluded um, companies that we think are a potential problem. We don't go into a company and, and try and change their approach to ESG where we're sort of making sure that um, that that they're um, they're passing those tests b- before we enter the company, um, but the biggest change now is um, is having to explain ourselves and and being held externally accountable. And bear in mind, you know, the Australian, you know, once again back to my my colonial days, and this is before you know ESG became uh, uh, fashionable. Gosh, the the amount of activism that used to happen behind closed doors between the fund managers and 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 company boards and and management, it was. It was very, very robust, right? And things that would would happen, you know, um, you know, directors would would leave, you know, management would would, would leave, strategies would change, um, but there was no sort of public, uh, you know, uh, wringing of hands or or no um, airing of dirty 
dirty washing, etc. You know, things were, were done behind closed doors um, because we didn't see it was in anyone's best interest to actually have a, you know, um, make a lot of things public. It's a it's a really strange really strange space, you know. And if I think about it from my finance days, and how do you map ESG metrics, you know, which is on some ordinal scale to some sort of financial performance, which is what a number of funds are trying to do, and yeah. show that ESG has this positive benefit, which is extremely difficult. That's that's the first thing that I find very hard to work out. And the second thing hey, is how do you invest in something which is an existing brownfield a- asset? And then say, well, hold on, I'm impacting climate change by that. Uh, it's a really tough leap um, that that I that I struggle to see, and so I wonder how super funds, as investors, and t- typically investors in brownfield, if you're in the greenfield space, I can sort of see maybe some different changes. But the idea of ESG and lowering cost of capital for good companies and raising the cost of capital for bad companies. I haven't seen academic research to really justify that. Yeah, I think at the extremes, you could probably see it. You know, I'd imagine the cost of capital for pure play thermal coal companies is going to go through the roof. But is that an ESG yeah. issue or is that just because that, that technology is not providing the same? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's sort of related, right? It's become a, a, an ESG issue. So, yeah, I guess then how do you, as a, as a manager of, of a portfolio, then deal with all these potential issues that come in? You know, do you do you have sort of a standard default portfolio where you, you try to do the best you can and, and manage all the risks and then you've got these other socially responsible style portfolios that have more and more constraints? Because there's a lot of constraints you now need to manage. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, we, we, we do both, right? We um, So we do have uh, our... ESG themed, we call them sustainable because you, you need a label and there's no right and wrong label. There's some call them ethical, some call them sustainable, some call, call them ESG. Um, so we've got them and they are actually you know, our most popular options uh, in, in terms of where the, the member flows are, are going. But then in our mainstream portfolios, um, there's, a, there's an ESG overlay, but I'll, I'll be, you know, it's an ESG overlay to the extent that you know, they are large positions. The reality is, you know, if you're buying, if you know, you're an investor like Unisuper, and with with uh, you've you've basically got an investment, some small investment in every company in Australia. You know, that that's that's the reality because we don't forget we also outsource um, our, our management as well. So so you know the fact that you we probably own you know a, a little bit of even the you know, 150th rank stock in Australia or the 200th rank stock in Australia. Now, can we run a, a you know, comprehensive ESG screen over over that company? No, we can't. But certainly all of our, our large positions, yeah, we're, we're very thorough with it. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you feel a little bit constrained around sort of the fiduciary duty rules around sort of sacrificing returns and, and the objectives of, of these non-financial concerns? We Well, we, we haven't been. Um, and once again, I can thank my... Uh, investment committee that I've got a very supportive investment committee that um, that is very aware of our fiduciary responsibilities uh, and um, you know uh, we've we've always been um, able to to manage money uh, in in our members' best financial interests. Mm-hmm. So let's um, maybe move to more of a closing question around the role of super and and nation building. Just curious, given the size of, of superannuation as an industry now in Australia, what do you see maybe as, as super's role in, in helping the Australian public? Yeah, look, I, I think the um, the term nation building, and, I, and I've heard it, I'm not exactly sure what, what the, um, you know, is it is it a bit of a, an exaggerated claim? Firstly, if you're buying a, a brownfield asset, right, by definition it can't be nation building, right, because it's, it's, it's already been built. Um, if you're buying a, a greenfield, investing in a greenfield asset, are you making the claim that if we didn't do it, it wouldn't get done? Well, I think that could be a question mark around that claim as well, right? Um, what uh, Clearly what um, super funds uh, have done the, during the GFC, they're doing it uh, against during, uh, during COVID period. We've been pretty quick to step up with cash when, uh, when our companies have, have looked to recapitalise. That, that's an important role. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, we do keep uh, companies honest. That's, uh, that's a very important uh, role that, that super funds play. 
but generally speaking, if we are looking at investing in companies that are going to give us a sustainable uh, profit stream, it, that's ultimately what our responsibility is. And, and that's the best thing we can do for our members. That's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for your time. A pleasure. Thank you for joining us. All views expressed on this podcast are subject to change and do not necessarily reflect the views of Connexus Financial. This podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment advice.